Hello everyone, Victor is here and in this video I want to talk about the stereochemistry of the hydrohalogenation and catalytic hydration reactions of alkenes. There are a few common tricks I often see instructors sneak into the tests and I want to make sure you're all prepared for anything that's coming your way. So grab a cup of coffee and notebook to work the problems with me and let's get started. So our first question here is to predict the product in this reaction. Well, we know how reactions like that begin. We're going to start with the electrophilic attack on our alkene, so I will show my curved arrows where the hydrogen from the HBr attacks the double bond and we are going to end up with the corresponding carbocation. This first step can potentially give me two different carbocations, one at the carbon number one and another one at the carbon number two if I number them this way. However, carbon number one is tertiary, so that is going to give you a tertiary carbocation. So here we ended up with a tertiary carbocation, which is not only tertiary, but also benzylic, which means that this carbocation is incredibly stable and it is more stable than anything else that we can form in this uh, reaction in this step, which means that that is the carbocation that I'm going to go with. The next step is going to be the nucleophilic attack by my Br-. So if I take my Br- and I attack my carbocation over here, then I'm going to make a product that looks like this. And here is something very important about this product. This atom over here is a chiral atom, which means that in reality I'm going to form a mixture of two different molecules. One is going to look like that, and another one which is going to look like this. And the stereochemical relationship between these two molecules is going to be enantiomers. And I can also double check that by assigning the R and S stereodescriptors to my chiral carbon, the molecule on top is going to have the S stereodescriptor and the molecule on the bottom is going to have the R stereodescriptor of my chiral carbon. So this makes those two molecules enantiomers. They are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. So why did I I get a pair of enantiomers in this molecule? Well, in this case, what happens is that the attack by the nucleophile on our carbocation can happen from either side of the molecule. The carbocation by itself is a flat, trigonal planar structure that looks like this, which means that if I have some sort of a nucleophile, and doesn't matter what type of a nucleophile I have here, but any kind of nucleophile that I react with can attack it from either one side or the other side of the molecule. So because of that, my bromine can attack from either front face of the molecule or the back face of the molecule, giving me two stereoisomers. In this particular case, it is going to be two enantiomers, as I have already mentioned, and because we do not have any factors in our molecule or in our reaction in general that would make one product more favorable than the other one, we're going to say that this reaction is non-stereoselective, which means that we are going to get roughly 50-50 mixture of both possible stereoisomers. In this case, we have two enantiomers, and the 50-50 mixture of two enantiomers is called a racemic mixture. And importantly, the term racemic is only applicable towards the 50-50 mixture of enantiomers. If you have a 50-50 mix of two dice stereomers or a chiral molecule plus an achiral molecule or something like that, then you can no longer call it racemic. Racemic mixture is always going to be 50-50 of two enantiomers. Well, do I always get a pair of enantiomers? Actually, no. Let's, for instance, look at this molecule. If I need to figure out what sort of a product I'm going to get that, well, the first step is going to be the formation of my electrophile because water is not electrophilic enough. So I'm going to say that, first of all, I'm going to have the reaction between water, H2O, and my sulfuric acid, H-O-S-O-O. -O and OH, and that is going to be a simple proton transfer where water is going to get protonated by my sulfuric acid like this, giving me the axonium ion, H2O+, and the conjugate base of sulfuric acid, HSO4-. Then I can proceed with the actual reaction where I'm going to take my alkene and I'm going to react that alkene with my axonium ion, 
protonating the double bond, leading towards the formation of my carbocation intermediate, which going to look like this, because out of two possible places where I can put my carbocation, let's call those atoms A and B, atom A is a secondary atom, so that would give me a secondary carbocation, atom B is a tertiary atom, so that one will give me tertiary carbocation, so of course I want to have a more stable carbocation, in this case that is going to be a tertiary carbocation, so I'm going to go with that one. After I have my carbocation intermediate, I'm going to do the nucleophilic attack by my water to give me a protonated intermediate, which going to look like this, and finally we would have to get rid of our proton from our molecule making it neutral, where I'm going to use water now as my base, so water going to come in, pull that proton off, and give me my final product looking like this. And importantly here, once the reaction is over, I will analyze the position of my OH group, and what I see is that that position is not chiral, which means that in this particular case, I'm going to get just one product and that's it. So that's just going to be a single molecule. Or how about something like this? The first step in this reaction is going to be the electrophilic attack, in which the double bond is again attacked by my HBr right away, giving me the more stable out of two possible carbocations. I can end up with a carbocation on carbon number one or carbon number two, so carbon number one in this case is tertiary, carbon number two is secondary, so I want to have a more stable carbocation, which means I will put my plus on carbon number one in my intermediate, like so. Now, the next step is going to be the nucleophilic attack by my nucleophile, which in this case is going to be Br-. So again, in this case, when my Br- attacks my carbocation, I can attack it from the front face, the face where I have this isopropyl group, or I can attack it from the opposite direction, from the back face, uh, away from my isopropyl group. Which means that I'm going to end up with the following two products as my final result. Now, if I pay very close attention to the stereochemistry of these products, I see that now I actually have two chiral atoms. I have a chiral atom with the atom next to bromine, and I have another chiral atom uh, next to the atom uh, with the isopropyl group. In this particular case, the relationship between these two molecules is going to be diastereomers. And importantly, notice that the stereochemistry of my atom with the isopropyl group did not change. I did not touch that carbon during my reaction, which means that whatever stereochemistry I had for that carbon has to stay just as is. So you can see that you cannot just blindly say that these reactions will always give you a pair of enantiomers. You can have all kinds of products ranging from enantiomers or diastereomers to just simple achiral molecules. So always make sure you diligently work through the mechanism of your reaction and then carefully analyze your products and their stereochemistry. Thank you for watching this video. Please give it a like if you found this video informative and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet. I would like to give special thanks to all of the OrganicChemistryTutor.com members and donors. I wouldn't be able to make these videos daily without your help and support. If you would like to become a member or make a donation to help me create more videos and tutorials for you, head to OrganicChemistryTutor.com and explore all the awesome stuff I have there. In the meantime, watch this video next and I'll see you tomorrow.